this is a celestial globe, a representation of the heavens, um, but the heavens seen from the outside, not the way we normally see them. We would normally look at them from the inside, looking from the center out. Uh, this is a globe, a celestial globe seen from the outside. Um, it's a very important one in the history of scientific instruments because it's the earliest surviving celestial printed globe in the world. There are in fact two examples, being a printed globe we can have more than uh, one, but um, this is the earliest example um, and it's a technology that's going to become important. You've seen so many globes, printed globes uh, of, the, of the heavens and the earth, it's going to be important and here we have the very first made in 1534, or thereabouts, in Nuremberg in southern Germany. And you might well ask, how could it have been made? Well, how was it made? Well, you can see that there are basically two sorts of components. There's a, a metal stand, so the legs and the feet and the, the structure that's holding it and this, this ring here and this ring, they're all made of, of, of brass or bronze. Then within that, within that, and with the ability to turn around because of the metal structure, there is essentially a printed object. Now that might be, seem a strange thing to say, how can that be a printed object? Um, but remember that um, printing is very new in the uh, early 16th century. Printed books are a very exciting technology. Books contain instruments, and instruments can be made of paper. And, and this is an instrument where you have uh, a printed surface, which is then coloured, uh, and, and then applied, stuck onto a plaster globe, and put in this framework so that it can turn round. So if we accept that this is a printed surface, how was that possible? How could you print onto a sphere? So how can you print a sphere? Well, at this stage, um, images of this sort are being printed using woodcut. So you have a wooden block, and you, you take away the, uh, the areas of wood that are not going to be printed, you're left with a relief pattern that you can, that you can ink and then apply a paper to and, and rub it on and lift it up and, and you have a printed image. The trouble with that is that it has to be flat and this is an object that is spherical. So how do you wrap the flat print around the object? Well, a technology was developed for making printed globes so that the printed image, the flat printed image, was a series of uh, uh, triangles that you cut out and then you apply them, them to it. But if you think about it, that's a very difficult thing to do. It requires a lot of careful manipulation and a lot of skill was involved in the workshop where this was made. So what about that workshop? Who made this globe? This globe was made by one of the most famous astronomers of his time, a man called Johann Schoener, who lived and worked and taught and made things in Nuremberg. He had a workshop, he had a printing shop, um, and he made things himself as well as managing his workshop. And that isn't a role that we expect of uh, leading astronomers, but Schoener had a European reputation. People came to study with him, um, uh, to, to work with him, to work in his workshop, and his business was very successful. He made and sold his globes through agents throughout Europe. So you might ask, well how can a leading astronomer also be a craftsman, also have a workshop and produce things? That's not something we expect today. Schoener is important in two ways, in two very closely related disciplines that were called at the time cosmography and cosmology. So what's cosmography first of all? Well cosmography is the relationship between the heavens and the earth. 
uh, and the representation through things like globes. Schoener was a cosmographer. He produced maps, he printed maps, he, he produced these globes. Schoener's great contribution to cosmography was the production of two globes. This celestial globe had a terrestrial companion originally, and you worked with both of them to show how time came from the rotation of the heavens, how the seasonal change came from the, the motion of the, of the sun, how location on earth uh, was, was uh, reflected in the appearance of the heavens. And for that it was very useful to have two globes to work uh, with uh, together, a, a celestial here and, and a terrestrial. So cosmography was one discipline where Schoener was important in his day, and the other was cosmology. Historians of astronomy are most interested, have been most interested in the past, in the changes that happened in cosmology in the 16th century. Their Copernicus was enormously innovative in, in saying that it wasn't the Earth stationary at the centre of the cosmos, but the Sun, and the Earth was a planet moving around the Sun. What had Schoener to do with that? Well, Schoener had heard about this a uh, uh, chap in the far north of Germany, in Frauenberg, a canon of the cathedral there, with these very original ideas about cosmology. And he persuaded a disciple of his, a man called Reticus, to go north to uh, Copernicus to find out what this idea was. Uh, Copernicus had been very reluctant to publish, and, uh, but he was encouraged by, by uh, uh, Reticus. Uh, to, to try out a publication. They publish one book, which is, which is actually dedicated to Schoener. That goes down quite well in the astronomical community. And then Reticus is uh, entrusted with the precious manuscript of De Revolutionibus, the great book of uh, Copernicus. He brings it back down to Nuremberg, where Schoener is waiting to, to facilitate its publication in Nuremberg. So Schoener was really instrumental. He was critical in the process that brought to light the cosmology, the sun-centered cosmology of Copernicus.